This first story is called The Rat's Tail. Okay? So when I was a kid, there was a tourist, a young man in Seattle. And when I was a young man, it's a kind of a polite way of saying long, long ago, right? Um, but this young man in Seattle, he was um, vacationing there, and he was staying at a hotel uh, down by Pike's Place Market in the pier. And he wanted to go out for an evening stroll and just enjoy um, the cool air and the lights of the city. And so he stepped out of the hotel and he could see there was a light fog coming in. And it gives kind of a glow to the, to the lights of the streets and the, and the businesses that was pleasing. So he's taking the stroll down through Pike's Place Market and there's all these interesting little shops down there, right? And as he's walking, he notices um, sort of a side street that's almost more of an alley than anything. Um, and in the side street, there's a neon light that says Ye Old Curiosity Shop. Okay. And he's thinking, why is there this business in an alley? And it has no window. It's just a big wooden door, right? And so it catches his curiosity, and he says, I'm going to go in and take a look around. So he walks in. And he's instantly amazed at what is in that store. There's um, all kinds of artifacts from the Northwest indigenous cultures. There's um, carved masks and you know painted totems and all of these things that came from the Northwest cultures. And he also sees that there's all these artifacts of Asian origin. There's brass and ceramic figurines and bowls and um, vases, all of that sort of thing. And being in Seattle, there's also uh, maritime artifacts, okay? So there's like a porthole window and, um, you know, navigation devices and, uh, you know, lighting that hangs from uh, different parts of the ship. And he's just really amazed by everything that's in there. But as he's walking around, he feels like there's something watching him. And he notices out the corner of his eye that there is this, in the corner, a brass rat that's quite large. And it seems like its eyes glint red at him, right? So he's got to go over and he wants to check it out. And he touches it and it, it's an amazing casting. It almost feels like you're touching the fur of a real rat. And it has the patina on it. It's, you know, um, not new, obviously. It doesn't have that shiny brass. It's the brownish color. And when he picks it up, it is solid. I mean, it's heavy. Clearly, uh, you know, an old casting, not something cheap like, you know, we would make today. So this thing, he's, he's amazed by it, and it's got these red stones for eyes, you know, and he's thinking, are these rubies? What is up with this thing? This is amazing. But as he considers this thing, he's like, well, what in the world would I do with a brass rat, you know? I can't put it on my desk. I'm not going to put it in my living room. What do you do with it? So he puts it down, and he walks around the store some more and, and sees, you know, other amazing things there. But he feels like this rat is watching him. He, everywhere he goes in the store, he feels like something is watching him. And so he goes back over there and he picks it up again. And he just thinks, all right, I, I got to have this thing. I don't know what it is about it, but I got to have it. So he's looking for a price on it. You know, he turns it upside down and around in circles and he can't find any price on it. So he takes it up to the counter, and there's an old man up there, uh, you know, long white beard, the worked. And he asks the guy, how much for the wrap? And the old man says, well, it's $100 for the wrap, but it's going to cost you $1,000 for the story behind it. And this tourist, he's thinking, I, he's taken me for a fool, right? I'm not paying $1,000 for a story. So he flips a hundred bucks out of his wallet real quick and he says, you know, you can keep your story, old man. I'm taking the rat. And he's out the door before the guy can object to it. Okay? And he feels like he's won some kind of treasure. You know, he's 
the master bargainer at this point. And so he's walking down the street and he's admiring his treasure and not too long after he leaves the store, he feels like um, there's something behind him. And he hears kind of a scratching on the pavement behind him and a squealing sound. And he kind of looks over his shoulder and he sees there's something in the shadow moving, following him. So this rat is following him down the street and um, he starts to walk a little faster. He's like, I'm gonna get away from this thing. Um, I feel like it's following me, I'm just gonna move faster. And before too long, that sound gets louder. And so he peeks over his shoulder again, and now he notices that it's not just one set of eyes behind him. There's like four or five sets of red eyes glowing in the dark behind him, moving, following. And he's starting to get freaked out by this. So he starts jogging. He's like, I'm getting away from these things. And the faster he goes, the louder the sound gets. It's coming closer to him, and every time he looks over his shoulder, there's more and more of them. And so pretty soon he thinks, well, maybe I should just toss this thing in a dumpster, right? And these rats can have it. I'm, I don't need this thing. But then he thinks, no, this is my treasure, right? I, I bargained for it, I paid for it, it's mine. I want this thing. So he takes off at a full sprint and he still hears them behind him and it gets louder and louder. And pretty soon the fog starts getting thicker and out of the fog, he starts to see the end of the pier and he can hear the lapping of the waves and he's running as fast as he can and pretty soon he's on the pier and his feet, you know, the sound changes, thump, 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 thump. And the sound of the rats behind him um, gets quieter. It's not scratching against the pavement anymore, right? But he knows they're still there. He can hear them squeaking. And he gets close to the end of the pier. You can see the end of the pier coming out of the, the fog. And he finally decides, I gotta just throw this thing over the pier. I, I don't know. So when he gets to the end of the pier, he kind of lifts it over his head and he gets ready to toss it. But he finds that at the very last second, he can't let go of it. This is his treasure. And as he's trying to toss it over the end of the pier, he goes in the water with it, okay? And the rats are going at a full run. I mean, they're at a stampede as well. And so they stampede over the edge of the, the pier as well. But the thing is, rats can swim, right? So the rats are fine. The rats are swimming in the water. But this tourist, he still has this heavy brass rat in his hands, and he can't let it go. And so pretty soon he sinks beneath the surface, and he drowns. And a couple of days later, his body washes ashore, and it's kind of chewed up a little bit and bloated, and you know, how the body would be. And the police report and the newspaper reports, they call it a suicide. That's, you know, well, that's what it be. Somebody jumps off the end of the pier. But they say that on a calm night in the dark, you can still see those two eyes of the brass rat shining up from underneath the water. And on a really foggy night, you can also see the rats gathering at the edge of the pier and they're all there looking at those eyes and they're still trying to figure out how can we get that rat. Okay. So why do I tell this story first? What, what is it that we would get out of this particular story in terms of civic engagement? Any ideas? So he's in the shop and he's trying to negotiate for the purchase of this rat, right? And you think back and, and the guy says, $100 for the rat, $1,000 for the story. And he says, no, I don't want the story, I just want the rat, okay? And that's kind of where our culture has gone. We want the point and that's it. Give me the point and I'm gonna move on. I don't need your story, okay? 
But without that story, what happens to him? Right? He probably wouldn't have bought the rat if he had known the story behind it. And so in our culture, we get to this point where um, we think that all we need are these you know, short memes. Give me a few words. Give me a 10 second video clip. That's all I need and I can move on. But the problem is we don't get the story with that. All we're getting is somebody's point and, and that point probably isn't the whole truth and it may not be the truth at all. Okay. And so, you know, um, we've really lost something in our culture with technology at this point. Um, you know, some of us remember again when we were young and we can remember grandparents telling stories or my father-in-law, he was an amazing storyteller. Uh, he told the same stories over and over and over again and it was funny or, you know, surprising every single time. Didn't matter. But with technology, what's happened to us is um, we're limited by bandwidth and we're limited by memory, right? And so we try and squeeze everything we can into social media in really short bits and chunks and we lose the story behind it. We lose the meaning behind it. And that's a problem for us because if we think about historically, um, the way that people in groups have maintained their communities and the way that they have um, communicated culture and meaning and knowledge from one generation to the next, it was through the stories they told, right? It wasn't so much um, facts that we get out of books now. Um, you know, we can, we can look anything up online in a second, but the bits of culture that tell us what's right and wrong and, and why we should or shouldn't do something, you can't get that out of a book. It doesn't tell you, um, you know, I can't Google, should I do this or should I do that? And it's gonna tell me the moral piece of this or the bigger meaning to it. What we need is um, to be able to recultivate this idea of storytelling because it is a time of civic engagement. And so if we think back to, especially like pre-literate cultures, what did they do? They gathered around a fire and they shared stories with each other. And it was the elders who started. The elders would tell the stories. And the young folk, they were expected to listen, not talk. And so they learned those stories growing up and then they became old enough and they would retell the stories to their children and pretty soon they're the elders and then it goes on. And so the culture continues from generation to generation through the storytelling, okay? Um, and we can think about it also in terms of like, um, you know, think about um, either yourself as a parent or when you were younger, your parents or teachers or even now public officials. We see this all the time. And they will tell people, do this, don't do that. And what does that do? What kind of a result does that get us? You know, if you're a kid, you say, why? And the parent says, because I told you so, or the, or the teacher or whoever. You're not getting the story. Um, and public officials, I mean, we've seen this in the last few years, you know, wear a mask. Well, I don't have to wear a mask. You can't make me, okay? There's no lie behind it. There's no story behind it that we, we lose meaning of um, the events in our lives. And so, again, this, is, this first story of the rat's tail kind of tells us that the storytelling itself is important. It is a part of civic engagement that is absolutely necessary. Because if I read a book, I'm sitting there by myself. If I'm watching television, I'm sitting there by myself. But what is storytelling? How is it different? Well, without an audience, 
I can't tell stories. But when I tell stories, we are together, we're together as a community, and we're sharing time, and we're sharing information with each other. So that is critical to civic engagement. 